So then we have the learning goals for today. We're going to become familiar with proportional control valves, which uh, basically means they act a bit differently uh, than what we're used to with the switching valves. Because with the switching valves, we are either switching them to, to one position or we have them in another position. And you might have this transitional position that acts in the few milliseconds between, between uh, switches. Uh, but with the proportional ones, we can actually regulate it so that we are uh, sort of gradually moving it between uh, different situations. S so that you don't really have the exact switching locations on the proportional ones. Uh, we're going to get to know how a proportional solenoid works. So a proportional control valve, which is controlled by solenoids. We're going to get to know how the position control of the solenoid will affect uh, the accuracy of a proportional valve. So basically, how we can determine what position it is in if we don't have any set switching positions, like we, we do in the, uh, in the uh, regular ones. So we're going to become familiar with uh, the design principles of different kinds of proportional solenoid valves. And we're going to get to know the pros and cons of having piloted proportional solenoid, val solenoid valves, which is basically the same as the regular piloted valves, where you have one smaller valve, which is uh, feeding pilot pressure into the larger valve in, uh, in order to uh, shift it. So just uh, in this case, it will be proportional and not have, have uh, set switching positions. So then we'll start looking at what exactly is a proportional valve. So the, the proportional solenoid valves, they come from regular switching valves, uh, and they've just figured out a way of doing this a bit differently instead of having a piston going between set locations. So we have electrical current flowing through the solenoid coil in the same way as we do when we are switching a regular su uh, switching valve for directional control. We are uh, generating a magnetic field in this solenoid coil in just the same way as we are doing with the regular valves when we are operating them with solenoids. This magnetic field induces a sideways force on the armature, which is the magnetic part that is pushing on the slide inside the valve, just in the same way as we're doing in the regular valves. And we use this force to actuate the valve itself. But this is where we sort of start doing it a bit differently because here we are not forcing the valve all the way over to, to the end position uh, or, or the slide of the valve all the way to the end position. We are just moving it uh, sort of gradually so that we can, we can decide location of the slide by, uh, by uh, applying uh, a certain amount of uh, electrical current to the solenoid. Uh, and we can do this because uh, we have a differently shaped, they're calling it a control cone in the beginning here, but I am feeling pretty sure, uh, I haven't managed to figure out exactly what they mean. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is a, uh, that they've written something wrong in here, that it's not called a control cone, uh, the part here. But wha what's uh, happening is that there is basically a ring uh, that is uh, uh, placed between the, let's see here. We have the armature in the middle, the magnetic part that's going to be, uh, be pushing on, on our slide. And then we have the, the coiled wires of the solenoid, which is going all the way around here. So we have uh, maybe uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands of, uh, of coils of, uh, of uh, copper wire going through there, creating a magnetic field. Uh, what these proportional solenoid valves have is that they have a non-magnetic ring that's placed in more or less in the middle of the, of the solenoid coil. And this affects the magnetic field in such a way that uh, by altering the current that we're sending through the, uh, the coil, we are altering the force of the magnetic field. So with a very low current, we're only going to apply a very low force on, on, on the armature. And if we increase the current, we're going to uh, create more force on the armature. So, so long as you have a, uh, if we have the, the slide of the valve over here, and then we have a spring in the other end,
This means that by applying just a little bit of force, we're just going to move the sli uh, slide slightly over. If we release uh, that current that we have on the solenoid, the spring is going to move it back. If we apply even more current on it, we're going to push the slide more in, we're going to compress the, the spring even more. And if we release some of the current so that we, we go back to the uh, lower current, the spring is going to push the slide back again because the, the force applied to the armature isn't strong enough to, to counteract the spring. Um, but it's still not going to go all the way back because we do have some current going through this magnetic field. So that it's a way of regulating the position of, of uh, the armature inside here, uh, which is a bit different from, uh, from what we're used to in, in the switching valves, because in the switching valves you are either putting current through it and it's moving it all the way over, or you are not putting current through and the uh, spring is moving it all the way back, so that you don't really have, uh, uh, you don't have this possibility of regulating the position uh, to a very, very uh, exact uh, location. Yeah, as, as I said, with the, in the ring here, it alters the magnetic field. That's why I'm, I'm a bit unsure if it's actually called a control cone. Uh, I think it's called some sort of ring instead, uh, because it says so one other place in the book. But in several places, it says control cone. Uh, but it also uses control cone for poppet valves. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's a bit, uh, and considering that I've uh, found a couple of other mistakes in these last few chapters, I've, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I can't really trust that part uh, of it. Uh, so here we can see it uh, actually in here. So this is the, the ring that's been, been drawn in here. Uh, so we have an electrical connection up top where we have our wires coming into the solenoid. So this is just the solenoid. The valve would be over here uh, if we had put that in. Uh, and we here they've put it up as a non-magnetic intermediate ring. Uh, in the book, they've also added control cone behind that again. Um, but I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not called a control cone. <laughs> I just haven't been able to verify it uh, from other sources yet. Uh, we have a center guide, which is this piece which is uh, coming in here, which, which basically is just centering this, uh, the rod that goes over to the, to the slide of the uh, piston. And that's a guide rod, which will push on the, uh, on the slide. There's a guide washer here, and there's a, a solenoid coil, of course, going around the entire uh, solenoid. And then we have the armature in the middle here, which is magnetic. And this part they call a pole tube, which would be the, the light gray parts up here and up here. Um, I'm a bit unsure if that's correct also, uh, considering that they've, uh, they're a bit inconsistent with the non-magnetic intermediate ring. Uh, and then we have the plane bearing here, which is just a regular slide bearing, so, so that uh, it doesn't have any balls in it or anything like that. It's just, it's just there to, to basically center the armature and let it slide uh, inside the bearing. And we have the housing of the solenoid itself. We have the balance spring, which is there to, uh, to to help push on, on the solenoid when, when uh, we need it to move back again, uh, and to help push on the armature when we need it to move back, when, when we are either uh, reducing the amount of current we are uh, sending through the solenoid or, or just stopping sending a current through the solenoid at all. And then we have a bleed screw up top here, and this tells us that this is a, a wet system. So, so it means that we do have, we do have uh, hydraulic oil uh, that is filling this area. So we have hydraulic oil uh, lubricating all of the parts in here, and we have a bleed screw so that we can get, uh, in case of air bubbles in there, we can, we can bleed off the air. <coughs> and so long as the, uh, the soft magnetic parts uh, and the control cone, as they're saying it, or the non-magnetic intermediate ring uh, part here, so, so long as this has been correctly designed, then the force increase on the armature will be proportional to the amount of current that we're sending in uh, uh, through the solenoid. So that if we, if we double the amount of current that we are sending into the solenoid, then we will also double the amount of force that it's pushing on the slide with. And the force is not dependent on the armature position 
uh, so that it doesn't matter if the armature has been moved all the way over to the end position or if it's all the way over in, on this side in the end position. It's going to feel the, the same amount of force no matter where it is uh, uh, within its range of motion. Uh, uh, of course, if you had uh, dismantled this piece and pulled it over here, it would be too far away from the solenoid coils. It wouldn't feel any, uh, any of the force, uh, magnetic force. Uh, but so long as it is within its movement range I inside the solenoid coil, then, uh, then it's going to, to feel the same amount of force no matter where it is. <coughs> this can be shown with these um, uh, force diagrams where we have the position of the armature given with a location X uh, just for, for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, basic position of the armature. Uh, and then we have the amount of force that the armature is going to be, be feeling. Uh, f from the uh, uh, from the solenoid coil, and as you can see here, the the, the armature, uh, the range of movement of the armature is shown with the, these uh, dashed lines. So it means that the the amount of force that it's feeling is uh, uh, more or less uh, constant within the range of movement. So that even though we have the coil all the way over on this side, then it will be all the way over here. Uh, and we apply a current, it's going to start moving over to the other side, but it's still, it's still feeling the same amount of current no matter where we, if we start pulling on the rod here and we pull it all over and giving it more uh, extra force just to move it, uh, then it's still going to feel the same amount of force from, from the solenoid part. So that I I it doesn't really affect it if, it's, if, it, if it has been moved. Uh, in the regular uh, solenoid uh, switching valves, that can be a bit different. Uh, because there you really don't need to, to be able to apply the, uh, the exact amount of force over the entire movement range. So there it is enough to, to uh, know that when it's in the neutral position, you are going to affect it fully so that it's going to, to switch over to the uh, opposite position. So, so that's all you need to know with the, uh, with the regular switching ones when you're using solenoids. Um, but it is all of the design up here with the magnetic parts that really allows you to do this. Uh, so one way we can uh, look at this with is to see uh, how the how the forces work when we are energizing it. <coughs> so when we have it de-energized, uh, the solenoid, uh, basically meaning we have no we have no current going through here. This is uh, the, the red lines here show us how much current we are putting in. So the uh, the capital I is usually what's used to show current, is measured in amps. Uh, so <coughs> here it is at full current on the top one. Here we have at 75% current, 50% current, and 25% current. So it's just showing different levels uh, of current that we can apply to the here. Of course, with current, we can put in 26.7% current if we want to. We don't necessarily have to do these four steps. Uh, we, we can do it. Uh, regulated quite uh, quite easily uh, within those, that's not a problem. <coughs> uh, but this is just to show, give you a feeling of at at regular intervals what uh, what uh, the force is going to be. But when we have it de-energized, then uh, it's this spring that's pushing it all the way uh, back into the starting position, all the way back until the point where this spring is counterbalancing balancing that spring, so that we we get an equilibrium in uh, spring force between these two, and that's the neutral position for the valve. In this case, the neutral position is uh, if that it's fully blocked off, so uh, there is no opening to the other side uh, in this one. <coughs> we can also see that by going to this side for the dashed line, and we can see that the amount of force that is uh, put onto the, onto the uh, armature is uh, pretty small um, in this case, because we have less we have zero current at all so we are way over here actually so, so the armature position is not affected at all it is only affected by the spring forces <coughs> so then when we put in a minimal amount of current so we, we put in 25 percent approximately in this case so then we end up at uh, uh, we need to follow this red line then and this is the movement the amount of force that we need in order to, to move our, our slide. So if uh, in order to move the armature uh, from this location over to this location, we're going to need this amount of force. 
if we're going to move it all the way over to the end location, we're going to need this amount of force. So that's the full range of, uh, of movement for the, for the uh, uh, armature in this case. So with very little current going in, we're just moving it a little bit. It stays closed. We haven't managed to move it uh, far enough to open up uh, the valve. But then if we increase the current, in this case we're increasing it to 100% of what they're, um, they're showing in the graph here, then we're going to get uh, the slide to move from this location here and all the way over here by increasing the current up to this level. So we are basically just following this line up there. And now we have a full opening here so that we are sending, uh, sending fluid flow to the other side of the valve. And one thing you have to keep in mind here is that we're uh, usually talking about a maximum uh, travel distance for this armature of just one or two millimeters. S so this is, w it's not really moving much at all. It's, uh, it's a very, very small range of motion that it has. And it's pretty amazing that we can, can control it this accurately just by uh, sending in uh, the correct amount of uh, electrical current in it. <coughs> so we have a clip that shows uh, shows a little bit about proportional control valves. Control valves are valves used to control conditions such as flow, pressure, temperature, and liquid level by fully or partially opening or closing. Traditional control valves are the most basic type. The flow control of a traditional control valve is typically limited to fully open, fully closed, or fully switched to a new flow path. Traditional control valves are of simple design and capability. Changing direction, flow, or pressure during machine operation would require a complex hydraulic circuit. Each desired direction, flow, or pressure would require an individual traditional valve to control it. Proportional control valves offer a solution to the complexity dilemma without introducing dozens of valves and hydraulic loops to the system. Physically, proportional valves appear similar to their on-off solenoid counterparts. The big difference is in the way their solenoid coils perform. Proportional coils operate on DC current and produce varying voltages that in turn produces a variable force to shift the spool. The graphic symbol for this type of solenoid shows the solenoid slash in the operator box with a sloping arrow through the slash. With proportional valves, the spool can be shifted against the centering spring force to any distance up to full shift by varying voltage and current. As the internal valve spool changes position, new flow areas open up gradually and continue to open wider during full spool travel. To eliminate flow lag from spool overlap, most manufacturers cut V-notches that allow some flow to pass as soon as the spool moves. Proportional control valves allow for variable control of spool movement which allows more step control and metering of flow, speed, and direction. Most valves of this design are used in open loop systems to smoothly accelerate and or decelerate an actuator or cylinder. The proportional control valve allows for a simpler hydraulic circuit, but it is not accurate over a broad range of pressures, flows, and temperatures. Neither are they highly responsive Proportional valves offer a variety of machine cycles which can safely be operated at greater speeds and result in improved machine cycle times and production rates. The third type of hydraulic directional control technology is called the servo valve. First developed in the 1940s, the servo valves operate with very high accuracy, repeatability, and high frequency response. Servo valves are highly responsive and capable of handling minuscule flow changes both rapidly and accurately over a broad range of flow rates, but at an extra cost. 
The main difference between proportional and servo valve circuit design is that servo systems have a method of feedback that assures that the actuator is doing what the controller tells it to do. Most industrial applications use feedback from electronic linear, rotary, or force transducers. A transducer is a device that produces an electrical signal in direct relation to a position, force, or speed. These devices feed a precise position or speed indication back to an electronic controller via a feedback wire, which in turn adjusts the valve. Fluid from the pump inlet is tapped off through filter elements, passes through orifices past both ends of the spool, goes on to nozzles and out to the return line. A feedback wire attached to the flapper terminates in a ball end that sits in a very close fit slot in the spool. When the torque motor coils receive a current signal, the armature rotates clockwise or counterclockwise and pushes the flapper closer to one nozzle and farther away from the opposite one. This allows pressure to increase at one end of the spool and decrease at the other. The spool then starts to move away from the higher pressure. If the armature turns clockwise, pressure builds on the left end of the spool and it moves to the right. With these very accurate feedback devices and a fast response servo valve, an actuator's position, speed, and or force can be repeatedly established within an extremely close range. Electronics provides the accuracy while hydraulics provides the force via a super responsive servo valve. I think it's just running the same uh, same animation over again. See if it does anything more a bit later on here. Proper evaluation of the requirements for a particular application can assist a technician with evaluating the performance of a valve and its suitability for the task at hand. I think that was everything. As you can see, the, um, the last part there uh, was with about servo uh, valves, which are sort of e even more advanced than the, uh, the proportional ones, but they work on sort of the same principle, that you can gradually move, uh, move the, uh, the position of the slide so, so that you have more control uh, on how much uh, you're, uh, you're delivering in flow rates, basically. Uh <coughs> It is one way you can look at it is uh, to sort of uh, it's sort of a combination between uh, a flow control valve and a directional control valve, because you will have ports that, that are coming in and ports that are going out of the valve, and since you can control the position of the slide very accurately, you can also say that, for an example, you are only going to have a very small opening here. So you're only going to allow a very small amount of fluid flow to pass through. So basically throttling the flow uh, if coming into this port. Um, and if you need more, you increase the current, then you're going to move the slide a little bit more. You're going to open up uh, the opening even more so that you get more flow uh, passing through it. So it's sort of a combination of a regular directional control and, uh, and a throttling valve or, or a flow control valve. So, so it's... Um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the best way, uh, the, the simplest way uh, of explaining uh, how, how the proportional uh, control valves work or how they function. Uh, if we have a proportional pressure regulator, it's going to be uh, the um, 
shaped more like a, a poppet valve, uh, so that it's going to have uh, full sealing in uh, between the the uh, cone here and and the seat of the uh, of the valve. <coughs> and only when we get enough pressure on this side is it going to open up and move away. And we are using the solenoid, uh, the proportional solenoid, in order to to tell it uh, what pressure it's going to open up at. So we're basically by if we apply more current here, we are putting more force on here, so we are compressing the spring more, which means that you will need more pressure in order to deliver enough force to continue uh, compressing the, uh, the spring so that uh, it will open up and allow flow past it. <coughs> and if we, if we release all of the current from the solenoid, uh, it's going to have a minimum uh, pressure that it's going to open up at, uh, because then uh, we haven't pre-compressed uh, the spring at all, so, so that it's going to open with as soon as the pressure exerts uh, enough force to, to compress the spring by itself. <coughs> and uh, in this case, we do have the spring, as you can see in, in the picture here also, we have the spring between the solenoid part and, and the poppet valve. So, so that uh, the poppet valve is basically balanced on the tip of the spring. But of course, as soon as it's pushed over here, it's, uh, it's uh, centered so that it uh, ends up blocking off the entire seat uh, of the valve. <coughs> uh, and it means that we need a uh, very little amount of current uh, uh, in order to, to preload the spring just slightly. So that uh, already at a very small amount of current, we're already uh, increasing the amount of pressure needed to, to open it up. And then if we have uh, a higher uh, higher current uh, going through the solenoid, we are, uh, we are going to need a much higher actuation force to, to compress the spring. <coughs> uh, and if we have a proportional flow control or directional control, it looks more like a regular slide. So a regular slide valve where we have the spring over on this side. I think that's the next one here. Yep. So we have the solenoid on one side, and then we have the spring uh, on the uh, opposite side of the slide, just like I drew here uh, for the regular directional control. You can also see here they have the, these notches drawn in, uh, which he talked about on the, on the uh, clip, uh, which is basically just to mean that uh, in this case, if we have no current going into the solenoid here, our flow is being blocked off. We can see the notches are going exactly along the edge uh, of, uh, of the uh, of the, uh, of the inlet port, so it's just at the control edge, but there is uh, some positive overlap to the, to the output uh, port. So we, we would, in order to get some flow here, we would, uh, be able, we would have to uh, apply enough current to move the slide so that this notch would pass the edge, the control edge there. Then we would have a small amount of flow trickling past. If we increase the current even more, we uh, would uh, move more of the notch past it, so we would get more flow, so we would be in, in a, a flow control phase where we are basically throttling the flow through it. And then if we increase the current enough, we are going to move the entire slide past the control edge and we are opening up full flow uh, to, to that port. <coughs> I think that was uh, basically what was said. So the, the armature position, uh, so basically exactly where it is with regards to its range of movement, it can be impaired uh, both by friction uh, when, it's uh, when everything is moving, uh, by the flow forces, uh, especially uh, the flow forces that are affecting the slide, uh, and also magnetization effects, so that you can have, you can have, uh, um, uh, I think it's called uh, residual, uh, magnet, uh, mm, magnetic fields uh, and stuff like that, where you basically um, steel components in close vicinity to this area have been affected by the magnetic field and they have been magnetized and they stay magnetized when you, uh, when you remove the current uh, from your solenoid uh, and that can affect, uh, affect the rest of it. You, you can al also have some of that effect in, in these uh, components, so, so it depends a little bit on the quality of, of the components you have, how well they have been uh, created. Uh, so if we want improved accuracy uh, with regards to knowing exactly where our armature is, you saw on the servo valves they had this flat
flapper up top with the string going down to the slide, uh, which was basically telling it where uh, by uh, reading off the tension on that string, uh, it was telling it where the, the slide was positioned in relation to the flapper. We can't really do that in the case with a regular proportional one. We don't have that flapper ability to, to use uh, like in the, uh, in the servo one. So instead, we are measuring the, uh, the position of the armature uh, with what's called an inductive displacement encoder. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, so you can't really <laughs> ask me <laughs> exactly how it works. I know what induction is, uh, and that's basically it's reading off the magnetic fields uh, in the, uh, uh, that the solenoid is creating, and it's also reading off the, the uh, sort of echo magnetic field on the armature. So basically what it is, what I'm guessing is doing uh, from the name here, inductive displacement encoder, is that it's reading off these two, two magnetic fields and it knows how they are supposed to look if the armature is in the exact uh, correct position with regards to the amount of current that's going to through the solenoid. And it is then measuring uh, uh, how much it is off from that, uh, uh, that magnetic field that it's supposed to be having. <coughs> So the me measured signal is sent to a computer. It's compared to the input signal, which is what it was supposed to, to be. Uh, and then uh, the difference uh, is, uh, the difference between the input signal and the measured uh, signal is then amplified so that you increase the current in, uh, or possibly decrease the current in order to move the armature to the correct position so that you are basically just correcting uh, the amount of current that you need to move the armature to the correct position. Uh, so you can have pretty, you can have uh, pretty accurate uh, uh, position control of your proportional valve. <coughs> and just uh, before I f forget it, uh, most of the ROVs that I've uh, worked with designing equipment for, um, they've been using proportional valves uh, instead of directional control valves, so that uh, they have, uh, even though you're using. Um, like in the uh, the mantis uh, cutting tool uh, that we saw yesterday, even though we had uh, our own valves placed inside the hydraulics of the tool, where we had our own throttling valves, we had our own counterbalance valves and check valves and everything like that, uh, it was still being controlled from a proportional solenoid valve inside the the ROV, <coughs> which basically meant that the ROV pilot was uh, sitting up in his uh, control room and he was. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it looks like, uh, like that is actually uh, altering the current that's going in. He, he probably has a, a uh, control switch which says how much pressure and flow he's sending through. Uh, b because they know what, what flow rates and pressures they're going to let through if they apply a certain amount of current uh, to their solenoid. Uh, so that's... <coughs> He's sitting up there and he knows exactly how much he, he needs to put through. Um, that makes it a bit easier when you're creating uh, external tools uh, like, like that Mantis saw, uh, because you also know that even though uh, the uh, regular operating pressure of that particular ROV, that was 210 bars, if I remember correctly now, uh, our motor, the hydraulic motor running our saw blade, needed 180. So we were thinking uh, to begin with that we needed to put in a, a pressure relief valve in front of the motor so that we were sure that it was delivered 180. But we were then told by, uh, by the operators of the ROV uh, that that was no problem. They would put it into their control systems that this e uh, exact port couldn't have more than 180 bars. So they would regulate it through their proportional valve instead. So that mean, meant that we uh, needed uh, one fewer of the more expensive valves uh, to put into our uh, equipment. So you, you can be, uh, you, you can actually, uh, e even though the proportional valves themselves are pretty expensive, you can save a lot of money by using one expensive valve and not having to use quite a lot of other inexpensive valves. So, so the overall cost ends up being, being cheaper. For it. <coughs> uh, so when uh, it has read off the difference between the input signals, it, it generates or stops generating the uh, amount of current uh, needed 
uh, to have, have the armature being moved into the correct position. <coughs> and it just continues reading these, uh, uh, measuring these signals and comparing them to the input signals. And it continues uh, altering the current until it has the correct uh, signals that it needs. So that it's a, it's a very uh, sort of, it, it's a loop that keeps on correcting itself uh, when you have these put on. <coughs> I think we'll do this slide before we, uh, we have a break. So this is a, uh, uh, we're going to look at the design and function of the proportional pressure regulators. So now we are directly looking at how we're going to regulate the pressure. And right now, if we're just looking at, at it like it is now, if we, if we disregard the solenoid part here, it basically looks uh, like the regular pressure regulators that we looked at, where we have flow coming in here. It has, has the possibility of passing through uh, the slide and up here. And if, if the pressure we have that's going through here becomes large enough that it manages to compress the spring of this uh, puppet valve, and opening up return to, to tank through the Y port, then the pressure on this side is going to, uh, to decrease, uh, but uh, due to the throttling point here, uh, the pressure is not decreasing on this side. So it's going to move the entire slide up, deep, uh, compress this spring, move the entire slide up, and we are going to get full pressure from P and directly back to tank so that we are relieving the, uh, the uh, pressure that is, has been built up, that we, uh, is uh, above our uh, operating range. And as soon as, uh, as, soon as this pressure starts uh, uh, being relieved, uh, we get to a point where the spring manages to counteract the pressure, pushing this slide back. But then we've also reached an equilibrium between, between the pressure coming in here and the pressure going up to the pilots. So, so that uh, this this uh, valve here has stopped uh, closed off again, so, so that it we now have everything back to to normal. So this regarding the solenoid, it looks exactly like the pressure regulators that we've looked at earlier. So, so it has the exact same function. I, it has uh, a bit longer pathways in this case, just to uh, to show it a bit better, I think. <coughs> but now we're going to look at how it functions with the with the proportional solenoid there. <coughs> so in, instead of having, um, having uh, an adjustable knob on this end where we can, we can turn the threads uh, and compress the spring and have it just set to a certain, uh, certain preset level where it's going to open up, we can here alter the amount of current that we're sending through the solenoid so that we can uh, change uh, the opening pressure of the puppet valve here at will. While the uh, while the system is running, and we don't need to be in the close vicinity to the to the valve. So if if this valve is placed on a uh, somewhere on a subsea production system or inside an ROV or anything, we don't actually need to have a diver come over here and turn this knob in order to to be uh, able to adjust it. We can just adjust the amount of uh, electrical current that we're sending through the uh, through the solenoid. Uh, so that's the the whole point with having a proportional um, pressure regulator. <coughs> so so long as the force from uh, from the armature and the solenoid here, uh, combined with the spring force uh, in front of the b between the armature and the puppets, so long as that force is greater than the pressure we have inside here, the puppet will, will stay closed, just as it does uh, in in the regular uh, regular pressure regulator. So when the force from uh, the pilot side here becomes too big. It's going to compress the spring even more, opening up. And again, we have uh, a decrease in pressure on this side so that the main slide will be opened up and we have flow from P to T. So again, this part of the symbol is the exact same as we're used to seeing, but we're also used to seeing the spring in place there, but now we have pilot pressure and we also have the, the adjustable solenoid uh, sig symbol there, which is the same as the proportional uh, solenoid. <coughs> so basically we're using the same, same principle for, for the symbol, um, which is what we're going to be uh, start looking at in, uh, uh, in a 
about a week's time when we uh, when we are done with with chapter 12 and we're going to start sort of building systems uh, on screen here while we are looking at uh, calculations and uh, how to how to design the systems and what you will see is that all of these symbols that we've been using for valves and stuff th they are built out of uh, building blocks basically so, so so they're almost like legos we have uh, this one, which is the building block for a pressure regulator, and if it's uh, if it's a uh, pressure regulator, it has pilot coming in on the pressure side. If it's a pressure relief, it has pilot coming in from the uh, the uh, outlet side. And then we can build, uh, put on these extra symbols to show what other functions we have for this one. In this case, we have we have pilot pressure going up here. We have uh, the spring, which is here. We also have the uh, proportional solenoid, so we we can sort of build our own symbols if we want to, just by saying what kinds of functions we want in place here. <coughs> just to give a uh, short uh, short example of uh, what you're going to need uh, in this case, so we're talking about milliamps, so zero to four hundred milliamps in order to to regulate the pressure opening pressure of this. Uh, this valve, so so we really don't need a lot of uh, a lot of current through it. Um, I can't really remember uh, the number, but it is uh, a couple of hundred milliamps that is needed in order to stop your heart. Basically, and and you really don't need a lot of uh, electricity to stop your heart. Uh, so so the, just the electrical signals that are already going through your body, generated by your own body, is in in this range. And, and we, we don't look at ourselves as being electric. <laughs> so, so, so you really don't need a lot of electrical currents to, to, to operate these uh, kinds of stuff. So you see, with, with this particular pressure regulator, you can regulate it all the way from around 5 bars and up to mm, 45, around there, just by switching the current from 0 to, to 400 milliamps. So, so um, you get quite a lot of effect from uh, very little uh, energy uh, in that case. Then we'll do a break and we'll uh, continue afterwards. Did you have a question, Glad? Or no? Yeah. <laughs>
Right. So we'll continue on with the uh, proportional valves. <coughs> so we're going to look a bit more at the, uh, the pressure regulator, which is proportional here in this case. Um <coughs> so we have the uh, pressure reducing part of it, which we can adjust by increasing or decreasing the electrical current that we're sending to the solenoid, which we could see in the previous one really wasn't all that much current that we needed. So so, so you really don't need, you, you, could, you could almost run them on, on batteries um, if, you, if you have an emergency situation where you're out of, uh, where you have a, um, a power outage for a couple of hours, for an example. And uh, I know that happened, uh, that was like two months after I started working for Emenko. We were uh, sitting over at uh, Riso, uh, just uh, beside the... Uh, able on, on the on the southern part of the island there. Uh, so that was where we had our offices back then. And there was suddenly a power outage in the entire town. So all of Ferguson was out of power <laughs> for, uh, I think that was, um, that was around the lunchtime that the power went out and it didn't come back until uh, five or six in the evening. So that might be a long power outage compared to, to running uh, stuff like this with battery power. Uh, you might start uh, having, uh, having to have uh, quite large battery packs uh, in that case if you have to run them that long. But for, for smaller outages and stuff like that, if you just have some battery supplies, it is actually possible to, to keep these running with, with, the, uh, with the amount of current that they're pulling. So, so you don't really need all that much, much uh, uh, power for it. Um, in the case where we had that huge power outage when I worked at the Menko, that was a bit different. As a mechanical engineer, you usually work at a computer. You can't work at a computer when you don't have any power. <laughs> so what we did was just uh, walk around uh, tidying up the office and <laughs> doing uh, uh, paperwork uh, if we had any. <coughs> so uh, again, uh, the puppet stays closed so long as the, uh, the pilot pressure isn't greater than, uh, than the solenoid and spring combined. So, and it's going to open up with the, well, did we do the same here? I thought I went to the next one. It was almost the same on that one. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, so now we're going to look at the flow control and directional control, uh, proportional valves. Uh, and here again, you can see uh, something that we've, we've uh, just briefly touched upon earlier. It doesn't really have anything to do specifically with the, with uh, being a solenoid or, or not. But, but here you can see uh, that they've drilled holes into the slide. Uh, and if you remember in one of the, uh, one of the other uh, valves we looked at, uh, it was actually, that was the way you recirculated it. When, when you were running full pressure and you had actually closed your valve, there were holes drilled into the slide, through the slide, and then out where the uh, return to tank was so that you could uh, you would have full recirculation, even though the slide itself was closed, so that it was blocking off flow from uh, from the uh, uh, pressure port to any of the others. There was a canal going through the middle of the of the slide and over to the over to the uh, tank port, so that you had full circulation, so that you don't have any uh, you didn't have any resistance for your pump w when you had uh, had it closed. And <coughs> that is another way of, of designing slides altogether, like this one, where you, instead of actually having, having pistons with, uh, with uh, rods between them, where you can actually just have one, one full piston and then you have drilled holes through it instead. So it's another way of doing it, basically. So y you get the same, same effect uh, uh, from it. Uh, and this is a directly actuated uh, proportional flow control valve where we have uh, the, uh, the solenoid connected directly to, uh, to our slide. Uh, just in the same case as when we have a, a directly actuated regular solenoid directional control valve. Then also we have the, the, the armature is connected to the stem which goes to the slide and it's uh, whatever force you're going to need uh, in order to move your slide, you're going to have to supply it through your magnetic field so that if you need more force, you're going to have to put in more, more current in it, which of course means that if, if, the, uh, if the valve part is starting to become really huge and you have a lot of, uh, 
a lot of inertia in the slide itself and you have, uh, have to have a pretty strong uh, spring uh, that needs to be compressed. Then you're going to have to have a fairly large solenoid and you're going to have to use quite a lot of currents, which is why we also have piloted uh, uh, proportional uh, valves. <coughs> but we're getting to those a bit later on. Uh, and in order to be able to do flow control here, it is a bit easier when we have uh, have these holes going through it also because then we are getting uh, the uh, whole cross sections which we're using as uh, throttle points uh, basically. So it's a bit easier to to regulate how much uh, how much flow we have through them uh, when we're doing it like this. <coughs> so the solenoid directly actuates the slide. And uh, we are basically getting the same function out of this one. So, so this one is a four-way valve. It has four ports. Uh, but it has more or less the same function as a regular switching valve, uh, which is two two-way or four two-way. So with a switching valve with two positions, either open or closed, or open or in the opposite direction. So that it's uh, it only has two two switching positions and one of them is usually open and the other can either be closed with uh, closed off or it can be going in the opposite flow direction from from the other one so it depends a bit on on uh, on how it's going to work but uh, you're basically getting the same function here only you can really regulate how much flow you are getting so instead of having it um, Instead of having it either either closed off or having full flow, you can tell it to to go from being closed off to having just a little bit of flow, so that you're basically doing the same effect as sending it straight into a a uh, throttle valve afterwards. So so you're gaining that. Uh, that function from your proportional control valve. <coughs> and this is the symbol for, for uh, this valve here that we have. So you can see it's been fully closed off uh, in uh, one position and it is uh, fully open in the other. However, since we have the proportional symbol here, we also know that it is possible to, to move it gradually between fully closed and fully open. <coughs> And this one, we need uh, a bit more uh, current. We can see up to 600 milliamps in order to activate it. And we're going basically from a full stop uh, of the flow and up to 8 liters per minute when we are increasing our current uh, on this one. So, so we, we need to, in, in order to open it at all, we need to be at approximately 200 milliamps. That's when we start getting a little bit of flow uh, through it. And then at... 550-ish, then we are getting full uh, full uh, flow rate going through it. Um, then we're going to look at the directional control valve. In this one, you can see we have the more regular-looking slide in it, uh, where we have pistons and we have uh, have the stems between them. We also have uh, have these notches, which were mentioned in the uh, in the clip earlier, where you can start to allow flow past uh, as soon as the notch uh, reaches the control edge. <coughs> and this one is also directly actuated with a proportional solenoid on uh, each side uh, in order to, to regulate it properly. And it combines two functions. The first one is to be able to electrically adjust uh, the, the flow rate, so just like a, a throttle point. And the second one is to be able to connect either A with P or B with P or one of them with T so, so that you get the, the regular, regular uh, four-way four -way, uh, connections uh, between them. Uh, and again, we had the direct actuation of the slide. And this one looks a bit more like a four three-way switching valve where you will have this third position usually so that's uh, most likely closed when it's in the middle that's what it looks like from the drawing here where we have pressure coming in at p and it's just stopping 
uh, in the p-ports. And we have both of these uh, armatures seems to be in the same location, just mirrored uh, and opposite of each other. And we have no flow from uh, between A and B and T there. <coughs> uh, so in the mid, mid position, it is closed off. And then we have in one of the positions, it's going to allow flow from, from P to A. And in the other position, it's going to allow flow from P to B. And then you have the opposite one will be going back to back to tank uh, on it. And again, the symbol looks pretty much like uh, like a regular uh, directional control valve. We have the uh, the uh, double springs in order to center it when we are not putting any current through it, and we have adjustable solenoids on each side so that we uh, know that we have proportional control uh, on it in in uh, both directions. Yeah. I'm actually a bit unsure about those dashes. I have never seen those before in it. And, and uh, the book doesn't mention them at all. So I'm a bit unsure if b b because uh, this should be all you need to know that this is a proportional valve. Uh, so exactly why they've put those dashes in there, I'm pretty unsure. Uh, I can check with uh, Rune if he knows, but since the book doesn't mention them, it's a bit difficult to know what they mean with them. Uh, I've never seen them in any uh, any uh, schematics uh, or overviews of of how how uh, of all of the symbols and stuff like that. So it's a bit um, there might be. I haven't really looked that closely at on chapter 18 in your book. Uh, that's a sort of an overview over symbols. So it might be that it's explained there. Um, I just uh, I, have, I haven't. Uh, I've actually re remembered checking uh, in that that place. So, but uh, but unless it says anything about it in chapter 18, then I'm really not sure uh, about it. I'll try try to figure out uh, for next week uh, why those dashes are there, uh, or if there are any reason for having them at all. Uh, um, my there there shouldn't be any reason <laughs> for having them. <laughs> so. Um, um, I'll just leave it at that for now, and I'll uh, I'll uh, try to figure out if if there is a uh, good explanation for it. So then we've got to a proportional uh, valve with uh, with pilot control. Um, <coughs> so we we've basically got the same function as uh, as we have with a regular uh, uh, directional control valve, where we are using pilot control, so that we have a smaller valve that is controlling the pilot pressure, and that smaller valve is using the pilot pressure to move the main slide of the, uh, of, of the larger valve. Basically just because the, the slide has, is uh, big enough and has enough uh, flow resistance from the ports and enough mass in itself that you need quite a lot of force to move it. So it's easier to just utilize the hydraulic pressure you already have in your system uh, to do it. <coughs> the obvious downsides uh, to piloted, uh, uh, piloted valves is, of course, that suddenly you have to be able to fill up all of these uh, pilot canals with hydraulic fluid. So your valve is basically going to be, be consuming part of your hydraulic oil. That uh, hydraulic oil will, of course, be returned to, to your tank as you are switching uh, the valve back and forth. So, so you, you will constantly be replacing what oil is in here, but one of these canals will will be filled with oil every, every time you activate uh, the valve, which means that you need to have some more oil in, in your system available so that you don't run out of oil in your tank when, when you're... Uh, so, so you can't just you can't just switch a directly actuated valve with a piloted one without thinking about how much oil reserves do I have so that when when I'm uh, using all of my consumers to the maximum, I've extended all of my pistons, filled them up with uh, hydraulic oil, and I've actuated all of my, uh, my pilot, uh, piloted uh, directional control valves. Will I then have enough oil left in the, in the bottom of my uh, tank? Uh, so it's just something to think about when, when, uh, when you're using these. <coughs> so again, this is a four three way. Uh, directional control valve. Uh, no, no, we have a four-three-way directional control valve acting as uh, the pilot valve, 
uh, and we also have a 4-3 way uh, valve uh, as the main valve here on this one. Now they've chosen to use a much more complex uh, symbol on this one and it has a bit to do, yeah, it's not a 4-3 uh, way, it's a 6-3 way valve. As you can see here, it actually has six uh, ports uh, working on all of them. So it ha has a couple of extra pilot ports. It has this uh, C2 and C1 port. Uh, so it's a very complex, large valve uh, in this case. Uh, this one, I can't quite remember what it is. Um, I've completely forgotten it right now. I checked it when I created this uh, created this uh, slide uh, <laughs> for what this one meant. Um, it wasn't something that you really need to concern yourself about in this uh, course. Um, it's a really advanced uh, part of it. Uh, but but I'll check up. Uh, I'll refresh my memory on that one uh, when I'm checking up on uh, on what those bars are for uh, for the solenoids. <coughs> Um, then we have the pros and cons of using pilot uh, uh, for our proportional uh, valves. <coughs> and it means that instead of increasing the size of our solenoids and also the uh, amount of current that we need to use, we can keep the amount of current very small and we can have very small solenoids uh, and we can just use the hydraulic power that is already present in our system to uh, to do most of the, basically do the heavy lifting uh, while we just use very small amounts of electric current to, to direct all of this power. <coughs> the disadvantages are of course uh, the additional consumption of hydraulic fluid, but also uh, hydraulic energy, um, which means that uh, our pump will need to uh, deliver a bit more energy in order to activate uh, actuate the uh, the um, uh, the main valve, so, so that when when the pilot valve is being actuated and sending uh, pilot flow to one of the sides of the main slide, then it's going to uh, require not only extra fluid to fill fill this uh, canal down there and fill the chamber behind the piston, but it's also going to need some of the energy in the system. It's not a really large amount, but, it, but it's a small amount of the hydraulic energy because it's going to need to deliver pressure in order to move the slide. So, so that's the, that's the uh, downside of using uh, pilot operation. <coughs> and for proportional uh, valve design, uh, you can choose between any of the valve types that we have up here and any of the two control types and any of the two proportional solenoids. So you can combine these ones if you want to. For an example, you can put down a, if you need a uh, flow control valve uh, with four ports, you can get a four two-way flow control proportional valve and you can choose to have it either directly actuated or pilot actuated depending on uh, how large it's going to need to be in order to deliver the correct amount of flow. And you can also choose uh, the amount of accuracy you're going to have uh, with regards to adjusting it. If you, if you don't have any positional control uh, of, the, uh, of the armature, then you can't really say uh, with absolute certainty that uh, your pistons are opening exactly what they're going to open. In the case of a flow control valve, you could have a flow meter on each side of it so that you could uh, directly see uh, how, uh, what effect you have from, uh, from your flow control, uh, which is, of course, uh, a possibility. Or you could put in uh, the function where you have positional control, where it's reading off the uh, magnetic fields and comparing them to the input signal and saying, that, oh, you need to increase the current a little bit here, or you need to decrease it. So <coughs> um, that means that no matter which one of these valves uh, you need, uh, you can choose to have it either directly actuated or pilot actuated. And you can also choose to have it either with positional control or without. So, so it's uh, po possible to, to, um, to combine uh, as you want here. Then we're actually uh, done with this slide. If you could uh, 
could uh, start on the next slide also then. So maybe we can uh, get a, a head start of next week. So we've looked at proportional control valves. We've uh, learned how how they work uh, with regards to, to being uh, proportional instead of uh, instead of just uh, direct uh, activation. We've uh, learned how the positional control works, not uh, not in the sense that we know how the uh, electrical systems and the uh, signals look like or anything like that, but we just know the the principle of how it works. We've become familiar with the design principles of. Uh, the different kinds of proportional solenoid valves and we uh, should by now know the pros and cons of having pilot operation because whether you have a proportional valve or not uh, it, it's the same pros and cons for having it piloted or not so, so you're going to going to end up with the same uh, same uh, same advantage and disadvantage that you need to take into account uh, by using it I just want to add a quick um, quick mention about these summaries and uh, learning goals that we have. Uh, the reason that I'm using them is that um, when I write in here that we are going to become familiar with something, it just means that we, are, we have uh, been through it. We've, uh, we know that, that there is something called proportional control valves. That, that is something. We can go into a book. We can uh, look it up if, if there is something that's a bit dodgy to us. Uh, when I've written that we need to know how uh, something works, that means that we, we need to try to remember it a bit uh, afterwards. So it's, it's sort of a, a, uh, a, a guidance list for what I think is the important parts of this part of the uh, curriculum. So, so that what we've uh, done in this presentation, the know-how is the uh, most important parts of this presentation, while the become familiar with is the, the parts that you, you really don't need to memorize anything, uh, stuff like that. But it's nice to just remember that, well, that was mentioned uh, in one of the lectures. It's supposed to be somewhere in the book. So it's a, sort of a, a way of trying to guide you to, to, how, to how to read uh, on these. Yeah? Uh, yeah, you, you could put it like that. I'm, I'm more likely to do questions with regards to the know-how parts uh, than if, if I do qu uh, questions uh, with regards to the become familiar parts, it's going to be more broad questions. So, so that's more like uh, list some of the uh, proportional control valve designs that you can use. Th because we, we have just become familiar with different, ki and different kinds of designs for them. So, so then you can just list, list them and the lists you basically find in your book in that chapter. So, so it's easy to answer that question while the know-how would m probably require more explanation for it. You would still find the information you need in your book, uh, which you are allowed to bring to your exam, uh, but you would need to do a more detailed answer for it. So, so the, the, the easier questions will be for the become familiar with parts and, and the more detailed questions will be for the know-how. So, um, yeah. So On those, I can go uh, back to them. We have plenty of time today, so uh, let's see. Uh, so, so the uh, these ones, the flow regulators. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, let's see, I'll try to do some uh, sketches also to, to get to show it a bit better. Sometimes it would have been really nice to have these uh, smart boards up here. Because uh, uh, Apple delivers them to, to um, uh, the, uh, the uh, primary schools and stuff in this area. So, so they have Instead of a uh, just a backdrop like this, they have uh, a proper whiteboard where they're using the projector straight on the whiteboard, and they don't use regular uh, regular markers. They use somewhere th there isn't any marker in it. All it has is uh, is a sharp point. So when you put it up here, it uh, the projector starts drawing where the point of your marker is. So that would have been really nice in this case because then I could have drawn directly on. <laughs> on my drawing there, so, so on the illustration. Um, 
It's a really cool, uh, cool system that they have. It's like uh, the kids get the cool stuff way before the uh, the grown-ups do. <laughs> so we have um, just going to do this uh, a bit more simple than what, it, what it's drawn in there. I'm not putting in the the throttle points or anything. And then we have the puppet going in there. And we have uh, more. flow going out there. <coughs> this one is going off to the to the solenoid up top. And then we have going to tank and going to the pressure ports. Um, oh, this was the one where it is uh, regulating the pressure. Uh, let's see. So what was it? Was it this one where it's going from P to A, or was it the one where it's going from uh, P to T? From P to T, yeah. And we'll do do this one. <coughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. This. It's not the best of drawings, but uh, hopefully uh, it's going to be enough for me to, to be able to show where the, the flows are going. So what's happening is that <coughs> we're getting uh, we're getting full pressure from our P ports. I'll put that in here. Full pressure from the pump, and then we have the Y port up here. <coughs> um, and this one is just regulating our pressure. So so it's not sending the flow further on to other consumers. It just it's just connected to uh, to the system, and if we get too much pressure, it's going to send some of the flow back to our tank. So that, that's the whole whole point uh, with with this one. So what happens is we get hydraulic fluid. Oh, that was the bad one. We get hydraulic fluid coming in here, and then as I've drawn it, it's going to just hit the slide and and stop there. But as you can see here, we have openings on the sides of the slide, which means that the fluid can pass around the slide in this case. So it gets over on uh, this side, and then it continues around this channel here and into, into the, uh, the slide itself. And then you have the throttle point in the middle of the slide there, which means that you are going to have, uh, have a, a throttling effect. middle there so you're getting full pressure going into the throttle point but since it's a throttle point we know that we get we get a pressure drop across it so we have less pressure coming over on this side and it is moving all the way here and it is pushing on on the puppet up top there <coughs> so the thing is if we get too much pressure in our system uh, uh, then we are going to increase the pressure that's coming on this side the pressure drop is going to stay approximately the same. We're not changing the uh, the size of our throttle point or anything like that. So it means that with a higher pressure on this side, uh, we're also going to end up with a higher pressure on that side. And when we get a higher pressure up here, it's going to open up uh, that puppet. So when the puppet opens up, if I uh, just draw it as open here. Then we get pressure going directly to tank. The, the Y port is connected to the tank. 
But since we are getting free flow of, of, of the fluid that is here back to the tank, we are going to get a dramatic decrease of pressure, of pressure on this side of the throttle point. And since we're getting a dramatic uh, decrease of pressure there, the spring won't be able to, to withstand the pressure that we're getting from this side all on its own. So that means that the entire slide here, it's going to, uh, to uh, open up. Uh, so it's going, I'm going to be pushed upwards. And that means that we are going to have full flow between uh, our pressure port and a tank. Now, my drawing here isn't really good because that's not going to happen uh, with my drawing. I'm going to need to just change it a bit to show exactly what's meant. We need to go down here instead. So that before this before this slide started moving, we also had pressure in here. And once it starts moving, we are going to get to a point where we get fluid flow past here, and we also get an opening here so that we get full flow back to tank. And as soon as we start getting full flow back to tank from our P ports, that's going to reduce pressure on this side of the main piston, and the spring is going to get the chance to push everything back. And it's also going to uh, uh, to make this one open, uh, close down again because the pressure is going to decrease again here. So that puppet is going to close. <coughs> so basically when we're looking at something like this, when we're drawing it in like this, it looks like everything is moving fairly slowly, but this one is actually going to be jumping up and down pretty fast. I, it's going to be a, a, a constant opening and closing of the one up there and then a constant jumping up and down of, of the main, main slide in it. So, so it's going to be moving pretty fast uh, w when it's uh, in use. So <coughs> uh, it, it's the exact same principle we had. Um, I can't really remember which of the presentations that one was in, but I'll see if I can find it. Um, You're getting the same the pressure relief valve same is one of the as, most important uh, types of this safety one. valves. This type of valve sets a limit on the rise of pressure within a hydraulic line. In normal operations, the valve is closed and no fluid passes through. But if the pressure in the line exceeds the limit, the valve opens to relieve the pressure. This protects expensive machinery, such as motors, pumps, and actuators, from becoming damaged from high pressure. Without a relief valve, pressure can continue to grow until another component fails and pressure is released. Pressure relief valves fall into two categories, direct acting or pilot operated. A direct acting relief valve is held closed by the direct force of a mechanical spring. The spring force holding the valve closed is opposed by the system hydraulic pressure. The cracking pressure is the minimum pressure at which the valve will begin to open. This pressure is set by changing the tension in the spring using an adjusting nut or knob. As long as the system operates at a pressure at or under the cracking pressure, the valve remains closed. If the hydraulic pressure increases even a small amount beyond this level, the valve begins to open and the fluid begins to trickle through. The pressure at which the valve is fully open is called the full relief valve pressure and is higher than the cracking pressure. When the hydraulic fluid in the system reaches the full relief valve pressure, the valve will be fully open and all fluid is discharged through the outlet port. A pilot operated relief valve makes it possible to handle higher pressures and flow. It's also much smaller than direct acting valves rated for the same pressure. 
This valve has two stages. The first stage is composed this of the This is basically the same design, the only instead of having an adjustment knob, we have the, maximum the proportional solenoid of the valve. for adjusting The second it. stage is composed of a much smaller, direct-acting pilot valve, which includes a pilot relief poppet, pilot spring, and an adjustment knob. This smaller relief valve is usually mounted crosswise on the main valve body. As long as pump line pressure is less than the relieving pressure set on the control knob, the pilot poppet will remain closed. Since the pilot poppet is closed, the pressure in the main spring chamber is the same as the line pressure. Since these pressures are equal, there is no pressure drop from one side to the other, and the main poppet also remains closed. When line pressure increases higher than the relieving pressure, the pilot relief valve moves to its open position. This allows fluid to flow from the pressure side through the orifice and across the pilot relief valve to the tank. Once the pilot valve is open, there is now a pressure drop across the main valve poppet with a higher pressure on the pump line side. This causes the main poppet to move, allowing full flow through the relief valve. The same is true in reverse. As the pump line pressure decreases below the relief pressure set by the adjustment knob, the pilot valve will close. This allows the main spool to close and restores a balance of pressure. Relief valves can be used anywhere in a hydraulic circuit where it's necessary to prevent pressure from exceeding a maximum level. Advantages of direct acting valves are their low cost and fast response times to pressure spikes. Pilot operated relief valves are advantageous due to their smaller size and ability to work with higher system pressures and higher flows. Is that a better explanation? You, you got where the flows are going? <coughs> right, then we've just got five minutes left, so I think we'll uh, just go, go for a break uh, instead of starting uh, for our next week. So uh, we'll, we'll wait until next Wednesday before we, we continue. <laughs>